What is your schedule like? I am up by well before five o'clock. Are you ever afraid, Sadhguruji, of being over revered? Young boys, girls, they'll all shout, Hey Sadhguru, hi! I love you! Uh, Nobody says Sadhguru, Sadhguru like... What was the toughest moment in your life? If I am not on the edge of life and death, uh, I'll get bored. Tell me some of the dishes you cook. Uh, if you eat my masal dosa, you will become my slave. I was very nervous, I must say, uh, <laughs> for this. I'm of no danger to you. What is the difference between karma and dharma? Crafting your life the way you want, this is the basis of karma. If you become conscious, people around you think you're superhuman. Namaskaram. Wonderful to see you <laughs> You say karma is your life. It literally means action and it's what you are doing in this life and what you become because of it is, is, is your karma. So can you explain to people, especially those who think karma means it's a reward and punishment system made by God versus karma is basically what you do in your life, in your, in your present avatar or something. Sadhguruji. Well, uh, when you say reward and punishment system, essentially you're talking about running the world with carrot and stick principle of greed and fear are the basic uh, ways of managing people, controlling situations. By using greed and fear, you can maybe manage social situations to some extent. Uh, but you, every human being, with a little observation, they know with greed and fear, you will be at your worst within yourself. Neither greed, which may propel your action, and uh, fear, which may curtail your action, both of them are not very pleasant experiences. Both of them are horrendous experiences for a human being. So, if it is only about pretentiousness, you can run the world and run your life with greed and fear or carrot and stake or punishment and reward business or heaven and hell. So, I've said this many times, uh, but it's super unpopular, but let me say it to you because uh, <laughs> you don't... I don't think you come from heaven, you look like an earthling, so I can speak to you. <laughs> 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 I'm... yes, it's from the streets <laughs> <laughs> So, see, heaven is uh, probably of the many crimes that human beings have committed against each other. Horrible things people have done, wars, caused famines, caused genocides, many terrible things, murders and rapes and whatever else. Of all these things, I feel the worst crime that humanity has committed upon itself or one human being committing upon other, is the idea of heaven. Because the moment you say heaven, you're saying, this is not where you live at your best. There is another place where your life will be fantastic. So essentially, this is a simple way of ensuring that you... you miss this life. All that we have here is just life. Life is the only and the greatest phenomena that's going on here. And it's uh, the most tremendous privilege right now is that we are life. So to deny... D to divest somebody of life, to deny somebody the possibility of life and say somewhere else it'll happen better is the worst crime that you can commit on any human being. Unfortunately, it's, go it's been going on for very long. Many religions have this concept, uh, like where you will go to heaven. I mean, if you do good deeds, you'll get to heaven. And you're saying, whatever it is, it's here. No. What I'm saying is, you know, there, were, there was a Kannada sage called Basavanna. I don't know if you heard of him, a Virashaiva saint. He said, Illi sallada oru alliyu salaraya. What it means is, those who don't make it here will not make it anywhere. Because if you are unfit to experience life here, with all your faculties intact, then you will... after you die, you will go somewhere and experience life in a fantastic way, is a, a complete uh, bypassing of life. Now, this is not about talking for or against some religion or some belief system. I'm just talking about... because you said this is not about reward and punishment. Reward and punishment in its ultimate form is heaven and hell, all right? So in that context, I'm saying, it doesn't matter who says it, Fundamentally, it is a way of skipping life here and trying to live somewhere else better. 
So, if people are so sure that somewhere else life is better, why are they not gone? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yes, so, everybody wants to live. So, we just keep on propounding these things, but we cling to life here because somewhere the intrinsic intelligence tells you this is life. In your mind, you can make up any kind of imagination you want. So, karma means coming to terms with the realities of your existence, that you begin to understand that everything that you do, everything that you do, every word you utter, every breath you take, every step you take, every intent and volitions that you create within you, has a residual impact on you. It is this residual impact that right now, in a way you consider as myself, your persona, for example, Chetan Bhagat as a personality, what is he right now? It is accumulation of various experiences, maybe not in its full dimension, but like the footprint of your life's experience is your personality right now, isn't it? Yes. What kind of parents, what kind of family, what kind of school, what kind of friends, what you did, what you did not go do, where you went, where you did not go, all this, the, ex you know, experiences, not in full reality, but like a shadow, like a footprint, that is your persona. So essentially, your personality is based upon accumulated memory. Memory can be genetic, can be evolutionary, can be conscious, unconscious, articulate, inarticulate, inarticulate but various types of memory make you the person that you are. So if you are completely invested in yourself or your personality, essentially your past will rule the future. If your past rules the future, how will your future will be? Maybe slightly improved version of the past. That's right. But karma means when you understand every action that you perform, you're leaving a footprint and that footprint is not something that you have to step into once again. You walked a path, you left a footprint, it, the, you, there is no need for you to once again step into the same footprint at all if you're covering new terrain. If you're not covering new terrain, you're walking on the spot, then you will be stepping into the same footprint again and again. So becoming conscious of this and crafting your life the way you want, this is the basis of karma. When we say karma, unfortunately, even in India, the word has become kind of a fatalistic usage. People say, ayo karma, as if it's being dropped upon them by somebody else. Karma means action. Whose action? My action. When I say my life is my karma, I'm saying my life is my making. There is nobody else managing, essentially shifting the controls from heaven to within. I like your concept that it's now, it's your action, it's what you make your life to be. This is the life you have. It's not going to be in the afterlife. It's not going to be when you retire. So I think that's, that's interesting because a lot of people are trapped in that. See, uh, the important thing is this. There is something called as intelligence and there is something called as memory. The biggest mistake that humanity has done right now, particularly our education systems have done to us is, we are misunderstanding memory as intelligence. If you read, read a textbook, and if you can re repeat it verbatim, you will be considered brilliant in your school. Well, all those brilliant people in school, look back and see where they are, they are nowhere to be seen. Only thing is because they will get a certificate, but this will not build any kind of competence because intelligence is a different dimension of life. Intelli life is intelligence, the very process of life See, this is one thing I've been repeatedly saying which, uh, <laughs> you know, people have issues with this. Everywhere in the world, people go about saying, God is love, God is compassion, God is peace, God is blissfulness. But if you don't go by anything that anybody says and you just pay attention to life around you, the idea of God, why has it entered our minds? Why did it enter? people's minds across the world, even those parts of the world which were not connected, still they had an idea of God. Why? Simply because there is so much creation and for which you have no explanation. So who made all this must be God. What is that God? If you looked at… Uh, if you had big animals around you, you made that big animal into your God. 
Otherwise, you made a man into God and or in India at least, we made women into God, goddesses and we made them big. We made them two hands didn't look enough, so we put ten, whatever. Mm. Essentially, our idea of God is our inability to explain the source of creation. So, the source of creation is God. If you look at creation, if you pay attention to... See, people are just looking like this, tourist... touristy eyes, I call them. They're just looking at everything at once. If you pay attention to any one piece of creation, a leaf, an ant, a grasshopper, anything, I'm saying if you pay enough attention, you will see whatever is the source of this creation is brilliant, intelligent to the core. Intelligence power, your imagination. But nobody said God is intelligence. Everybody is saying God is love. Those who are deprived of love, are they calling God is love? To be loving, you don't need God. If you make yourself pleasant, people will love you and you can love people. Or if you don't, nobody cares for you, you can just get yourself a dog. Why are human beings not happy in general? And a lot of rich people are not happy. No, just because they have a few bucks, they think they have everything. That's the biggest mistake they're making, okay? <laughs> Now, uh, I must tell you, shall I tell you my problems? Yes. <laughs> this happened to me when I was twenty-five years of age. Suddenly one day I was just sitting in a place and I just burst into an ecstatic state, every cell in my body overflowing with ecstasy. Then I paid attention to this, what is happening within me, am I going crazy, is something else happening to me? But then I saw, if I don't just mess with my mind, I'm just ecstatic, like dripping ecstasy in every cell in my body. Then I thought, oh, this is something fantastic that I have discovered. I did not have any connections with the yogic traditions or spiritual traditions of the country. I grew up totally divorced from all that, very influenced by the West, you know, sixties, Beatles and da-da-da, okay <laughs> So, uh, I thought I was the first one who discovered this and then I thought, who wouldn't want this? Who wouldn't want it? Why wouldn't anybody want to be ecstatic? So I sat down and made a plan. On that day, the world's population was 5.6 billion people. I sat down and made a plan that in two and a half years' time, I will make the whole world ecstatic. See, it's over forty years now. <laughs> I mean, that, that was an ambitious goal. <laughs> I, so we have touched a little over a billion people today. But that's not my idea of the world, it's 7.6 billion now, all right? So why I'm saying this is, what is it? Because people are so invested in their miseries, they're afraid even to leave their misery because they're so invested in this. Why has this happened? Is this a manufacturing defect? No, 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 it's not a manufacturing defect, but in a way, there is some element of that in the sense, see, Charles Darwin went about telling you, that, you know, a goat could have become a giraffe and it took so many million years, a pig could have become an elephant, it took so many more million years. But a monkey became a man rather quickly, so quickly that people believe there must be a missing link somewhere, okay? <laughs> so the problem... <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that between a, a chimpanzee and a human being, the DNA difference is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent is not a great percentage, all right? But in terms of in... in, in biologically, we are only 1.23 percent away from a chimpanzee. But in terms of our intelligence and awareness, we are worlds apart from a chimpanzee. And this is our problem. We have an intelligence that we have not figured how to handle. Right now, humanity is not suffering something else. They're suffering their own intelligence. You remove half their brain, all of them will become peaceful. So right now, they're suffering their intelligence, which is the greatest gift that we have. But unfortunately, we're suffering this. That is why yogic sciences always work upon stabilizing the platform. You stabilize your system in such a way that your intelligence, suddenly you realize, is the greatest privilege you have on this planet. But unfortunately, most human beings, or a lot of human beings at least, are suffering their own intelligence. See, if you are with me and you are suffering, you can always blame it on me. If you are alone in your home and you are suffering, obviously you are in bad company, isn't it? <laughs> That's true.
<laughs> Though I must say, I think when I see some people, I think the difference is less than 1.23%. So, that's <laughs> no, a stir. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, let's not go there. I have so many other questions. What can a guru add to a person's life? And as a side question to that, why are gurus more accepted in India? And, and why do so many of them come from India? Well, uh, the word guru means... Gu means darkness, Ru means the dispeller. One who dispels your darkness is a guru. Well, if you want to call him a light bulb, you can call him that, it's up to you. But the important thing is, with him around, you saw things more clearly than you would have otherwise seen, that's all. So can you not do it by yourself? You can. But the problem is, your life is a very limited amount of time. L human life is very brief. If you're exploring full depth and dimension of who you are and the nature of being human, then the time allotted to us, which may be effectively fifty, sixty years of active life, leaving childhood and geriatric stages of your life, fifty, sixty years of active life, these sixty years of active life is too little for what possibilities human being hold. So, we have always, as human beings, we have learned from other people's experiences whether it's our parents or teachers, what we call as education, everything we learn from other people's experience because the possibility of our life is so big. If we were just, uh, let's say, if you and me were just buffaloes, all we had to do was just learn what kind of grass I can eat, what kind I cannot eat, where is the water, what is the way, how to reproduce, this is it. So there was nothing more to learn. So you didn't need a guru there because by your own instinct and little by example, you just learn from around you. Because for all other creatures, ninety percent of their life is fixed by nature. Only ten percent latitude nature has left for them to do their own thing. But with the human being, only ten percent is fixed, ninety percent is left in our hands. And this freedom is what human beings are suffering right now. So a guru comes into place because you want to travel an uncharted path. See, I trek in... every year I've been trekking in uh, Nepal and uh, Tibet. There these Sherpas and some of the Tibetans uh, guides are there. These guys are born and brought up in the mountains, they're just... you know, they're like mountain goats. They're as fit as uh, mountain goats and they're as instinctively right about the paths that they take. So now uh, when I'm on the mountain with them, those guys barely talk, if, uh, you know, if there are two paths like this, uh, if you ask him, which way to go, he says, hmm. I just follow him. On the mountain, you don't try to teach him guru, uh, guru business, because he's the guru. He knows the terrain better than you. So you just follow instructions. Similarly, when it comes to inner dimensions of life, when somebody has already traversed the path, you go by that, otherwise, to know what is next door, you may go around the world and come there, but you don't have that much time. So a guru becomes relevant so that you share another person's experience of a journey so that very easily you can get there. If you want to do it all by yourself, we don't know how long you will take. The next question is, you know, faith versus science is this constant debate and there's value in both. There's a kum mela going on, which is a, a very big faith. If faith says take a dip, Science says, don't take a dip. How... how... Do, how is one to reconcile this? So let me uh, put this into the right perspective, in the sense... So you must understand, India, Bharat as a culture, is not a land of faith. It is a land of perception, it is a land of seeking, it's a land of knowing. It is not a land of God, it is a land of liberation. Our ultimate goal is mukti, not to go and sit in the heaven on God's lap. That's not our goal. We want to attain mukti, liberation. In this direction of seeking liberation, in this direction of seeking the truth or knowing the truth, many things we observed in nature. So some of the things that we observed, because you're talking about the kum per se, uh, we notice that in the northern hemisphere, from zero latitude to thirty-three degrees latitude in the tropical climate, the centrifugal force... centrifugal force is working almost in a vertical manner from the planet. So this is why we said this is a spiritual part of the la 
planet. Here, spiritual process is easy because there's a natural upsurge of energy. If you do any kind of sadhana, it produces b best results. So, there's a twelve-year cycle, the solar cycle is twelve years, or to be precise, it is uh, 4,356 days. So, this 4,356 days is uh, considered one cycle. In this cycle, there are four segments. So, these four segments, the focus is on different parts of the geography. This is what you have identified as four places of Kumbh. And to experience this, wherever water is in confluence with a certain amount of force and geographical location of that place plus the time of the year creates a certain, uh, what to say, a certain force with which one can benefit. So the idea is, today everybody is going there just for a day, one day is dip and coming. The idea was, if you go there to this Tirtha Kshetra, you're supposed to stay there for forty-eight days minimum, one mandala, so that your body will be transformed, your energies will be transformed, you become a great possibility. So for this twelve... once in twelve year event, people are waiting to go to any one of these four places because it happens at different times, uh, so people are trying to go there. So, having said that, is right now what was understood as a scientific way of enhancing human... a uh, human being. Because our culture is always about... even our idea of God is always about empowering ourselves. It's not about seeking uh, help from God. It has all come only in recent times in imitation of things the, from outside. Otherwise, when we say karma, it's a very clear statement. Your life is your making. There is simply no two ways about it. It doesn't matter how many distortions have happened in the few thousand years, but fundamentally, your life is your making because it's your making. You want to use every little support that is there in the geography, in the celestial objects. You want to use every support to enhance yourself towards liberation. So in this effort, these festivals have become massive uh, accumulation of people. And as you know, the Allahabad one, which happens once in twelve years, is the biggest one. And um, three others which happen now, one that you're talking about is Haridwar. Should we have managed this better? One hundred percent, we should have managed it better. But can you manage it? Because we have never understood how to manage these things because people just come from everywhere. They don't come in a planned way, in buses and this thing, and it's not like a organized tour. Each individual is coming in his own way, from... some are walking, some are coming by bus, some are driving, simply they're coming from all over. So could we have managed it? Maybe we could have better educated them, which uh, I don't know why it did not happen. Maybe they did, but still, you know, once people come together in that fervor of wanting to get into the water at the right time to benefit uh, <laughs> in a big way, I think uh, things... Uh, went yeah. the way they went. I mean, three million people, three million people. And I think the Prime Minister himself today tweeted that let's make it symbolic now. And... and so... I, I mean, think I also tweeted you, about like, it, say... whatever we have, whether it's religious events, political events or social events, let's understand all this is about the value of human life. Let's not forget that all this is being done to enhance human life, not to lose human life. So today we are in a unique situation, a pandemic like never before. Earlier pandemics were there, but human beings were not as mobile and as traveling as they are today. So they largely got contained to certain areas in the world, but today because human beings are traveling everywhere, this pandemic is unique in its reach and how rapidly it spreads from one place to another because of our transportation system. We not only transport human beings, we also transport virus in our airplanes, our trains, our buses, our cars. They transport human beings along with the virus and, uh, well, the nation is uh, facing a significantly difficult situation. Uh, many people thought we are over the hill and now it is, you know, downslope run. But no, once yeah. again, we have hit an upslope. I think we need to handle this responsibly. Everybody must understand uh, whatever our religious uh, beliefs, whatever our spiritual needs, whatever our political uh, needs and social uh, obligations, we must maintain basic protocols and minimize 
our assembly, you cannot tell for years on end, you cannot tell, don't assemble at all, it's not going to help. They're already saying weddings which are already fixed can go on, and this can happen, that can happen, but whatever happens, the most important thing is conscious and responsible behavior is a must, otherwise, as a nation, we will suffer. So let not individually responsible behavior make the entire nation suffer. Already nation has paid enough price, across the world over three million people have died. And at least as a regard and respect for those who have lost their lives, and those who have lost who are dear to them, I must tell you this, just uh, ten days ago, I lost my cousin brother, who was just... who was one year younger to me. A brilliant guy, a PhD in entomology, all this. He got... I don't know where he got the COVID and he died. And the family sends messages, nobody should come because we don't have the body. From the hospital, it's going straight to the crematorium without any participation from the family. You can imagine the pain and uh, turmoils the wife and the children and everybody else goes through. So when all these things are happening, please, uh, at least as basic human expression, let us maintain the protocols, let us wear masks if we are among people. If you don't want to wear a mask, please go and walk in a desert or in a forest or somewhere. Don't walk in human societies, that's all. How does one cope mentally though? I mean, you, you know, a lot of times people in India, they... they the India people in India are very trained at ignoring poverty. For example, I live in Mumbai. We we lot of people ignore the slums because you can't look at them all the time and see the poverty and and go about your life or go to a party straight after like that. Right now, there is just so much suffering that it's and you open the TV or the internet or everywhere. How how does one cope? I mean, is 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 it the same way? Meditation and praying or. Is it staying present or your breath? The things you often talk about, are those things relevant? Is there something else people should do right now to just, just cope, you know, and not lose hope? Young kids are telling me, we'll never get a job. What is going to happen to my life? It's like, what, what would you say to, to such people? See, one thing is uh, a whole lot of people in the world go about like they're immortal. Now, mortality is staring in your face like never before, probably. So this is one thing that's upsetting people. We need to understand, if we have to stay sensible, we have... we must be consciously aware. Every moment of our life, if we are aware that we are mortal, we will organize and plan our lives and the little time that we have and the energy that we have in the best possible way. This idea that other people die, no, 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 you and me will die. We want to complete our time and die, that's all. There's no such thing as we will not die. But everybody thinks other people die. No, no, no. You and me will die. That goes for everybody. We are all mortal creatures. We are all dying kind, all right? Now, with the virus, it's staring in our face, but it was always staring in our face and we were missing the point. Having said that, this is not to be insensitive to the deaths that have happened, loss of dear ones, loss of economic losses, loss of jobs, everything. But we need to understand this. This is a time when mortality is so obvious to everybody, this is a time to understand our focus should be on the nature of our life and the quality of this life. Right now, most people's focus is on their lifestyle. So everybody's crying about the loss of lifestyle. I'm saying if you have life, it's good enough. Lifestyle is just of our times. If all of us were here a thousand years ago, maybe all of us would be living in huts. Those people that you think in Mumbai are very poor, maybe we would be in same kind of squalor and we wouldn't mind, we thought it's fine, all right? So right now, somebody else is living in a better house, uh, comparing myself to that person, now I suffer my home. This need not be so. Do not be committed to lifestyle. Your commitment should be to make this life as beautiful as possible. If you shift this focus, we will go through any kind of time. We must understand this compared to previous generations of people. There were world wars, there were famines, there were terrible events that happened in the world and including in India, all right? This generation, we have not seen anything like that. This is a bad one. But still, it's a soft ball. If you behave responsibly, it is not going to hit you. However responsible you are, 
if a war is happening, bombs would... you know, bullets and bombs would just kill you, it doesn't matter where you are. Today, unfortunately in India, we have this problem because I've been talking to so many people, I'm saying this. People think war means it happens on the border. <laughs> no, it is happening on the border, it is happening on the border because a few brave men and women are standing there and because of their efficiency, it is happening only on the border. If they don't stand there, it will be happening in Delhi. Correct, and now nobody heard of airplanes and atom bombs which everybody has and uh, they they can go well past the border and they have drones and all those things. No, it's no, no, their soldiers right. themselves I mean, I... will be walking our streets. If our soldiers are That's not true. doing their job well, their soldiers, the enemy soldiers will be walking on the streets, all right? And you know all the terrible things that have happened with the past invasions, don't forget that. I am saying that way, as a generation of people, in terms of comforts and conveniences, no generation ever had these kind of comforts and conveniences. No generation had survival better organized th than this generation. We just have to make sure nobody starves, that's all. Rest of it is only loss of lifestyle, don't make big fuss about it. This is a time for every human being to build themselves into a higher possibility. Either in your competence, in your emotion, in your thought, in your experience of life, in your joyfulness, in your peacefulness, in every way, please use this time to upgrade yourself. When time to act in the world becomes open, you will be in a great advantage. Rather than sitting and crying, right now WHO is saying, that it is not just this pandemic, there is going to be a mental pandemic and there's going to be a suicide pandemic. See, our problem is if we get one problem, we want to multiply it into many. No, if you get one problem, let's see how to handle that. L don't multiply it in your head. Yes, it is a serious issue, it's not a joke. Yes, there is tremendous losses for everybody, but focus on being committed to your life, not your lifestyle then you will see everything will change in many ways. I don't know why WHO is saying it's going to come later. Uh, it's already there. Um, and what do you want to say to that? You know, a lot of youngsters, they're 18, 20, and they're seeing these fancy cars and fancy bodies and fancy holidays. And they don't see that around them or a path or a ladder to get there. And, and that leads to unhappiness. See, uh, if you committed to a lifestyle without being committed to enhancing this life. Inevitably, one way or the other, you will move into crime. Maybe crime outside of the law or crime within the law, but inevitably you will move into crime once you're committed to lifestyle. If you're committed to enhancing your life, lifestyle will happen according to our competence and in the times in which we live. See, we must understand our lifestyles are all not made by us. Our lifestyles are of the times. See, right now, in uh, twenty-three, twenty-four hours from India, I'm here in United States. If it was a uh, hundred years ago, coming to United States means probably forty-five, fifty days up and forty-five, fifty days down, all right? But people are saying this, twenty-two hours of flight is too long. You know, repeatedly they're telling me, I said, what is too long? I'm glad it's only twenty-two hours. Otherwise, uh, people were, you know, sitting on a steamship and going, before that on a sailboat, not even knowing whether they'll get there or not. And, and before that, there was no Suez Canal or a stuck Suez Canal, <laughs> then you are in trouble. <laughs> if you're going on no, you could also <laughs> have a round Canal. trip around Africa, so African safari and then get to America. So I'm saying we are having as a generation of people, we have the best of everything. Never before humanity has had these kind of things. Now, if we commit to enhancing our life rather than just enhancing our lifestyles, we can become the best generation ever because our survival issues are largely settled. We must understand this three hundred years ago, if you want water in the morning, you had to walk down to the well or river or pond to carry two buckets of water. Today, how many young men and women are even capable of carrying two buckets of water a mile? Physically capable, they're not anymore. 
<laughs> I'm saying. So you open the tap, water comes, hot water comes, cold water comes, everything happens and you're cribbing and cribbing and cribbing. Please don't crib, use your life because whether you do something or not, whether you're joyful or miserable, whether you're making something out of yourself or nothing out of yourself, time is rolling away, time is ticking away. You must understand that since you and me started talking, everybody who is listening and all of us, including you and me, are forty-seven minutes closer to our grave. Wow, that's comforting to hear. Okay. No, no, that is... <laughs> well, it's at least a good... it was a good... For, it's a good forty-seven minutes. We no, are... Yeah. it is. All... all forty-seven minutes are good, actually. It is just that I'm saying, if you think about it once in a way, it causes paranoia, but if you listen to the body, every beat in the body, it is clearly saying it is mortal, all right? Always it is reminding you it is mortal. If you are conscious every moment of your life, well, you wouldn't want to waste one moment doing something that doesn't mean anything to you. You would do only what truly matters to you. If all of us were doing only what genuinely, genuinely matters to us, we will be living in a fantastic world, pandemic or no pandemic. Oh, thank you. You've been teaching yoga for the last several decades, but in the last 10 years, it's been very dramatic or um, it may be even last 15. What was the point at which you felt, okay, this is going really big now? I told you in 1982, <laughs> when I experienced this, I thought 5.6 billion people is no big deal in two and a half years, I will make it. I was uh, riding all over the country on my motorcycle and I thought I will ride across the world and make it happen to every human being on the planet. Well, it took a long time and then there were other commitments which I had to fulfill. But this happened in, uh, I think, nine, 2005 or six. One day, uh, I was here in United States and uh, some of our uh, volunteers, you know, this is a completely volunteer-run organization. They were looking on the internet and uh, they said, Sadhguru, did you know that every day on that day, about hundred thousand people type the word spiritual online? I said, is that really so? That much interest in spirituality? Please type it out and see what is there. They typed out the word spiritual and the first thing that came was a spa in Mexico. Second, this <laughs> second thing that came was a call girl in Northern California. And I looked at this and said, oh, is... I, because I she says understand. spiritual love, spiritual this thing, spiritual... The... She's learned the SEO, all right? <laughs> Then I was just discussing okay. this, how is this possible? Spirituality means people have... should have looked towards India, but everybody is looking for a spa or a call girl or something, and I'm sure a whole lot of people believe that's where spirituality is. Then I was looking at this, what are people doing on... online? Then I'm consulting one... somebody who's supposed to be some kind of an expert and I ask him, what are people searching for? Because I don't have the time to be searching online anything, I, life keeps me busy all the time. He said, uh, very casually, you know, he's saying, uh, Sadhguru, about seventy percent of the data is pornography. I said, what? It can't be. And I checked with a few other people, they said, oh, yeah, Sadhguru, somewhere around that. Then I thought, you have such a fantastic technology, for the first time in the history of humanity, you can sit here and talk to the entire world if you want. You can pass on any kind of message to the entire world and all that's happening is pornography and they told me some absurd number of people, I... Uh, I don't exactly remember the number, but well over a million. They're saying below fifteen years of age, that many children are being sold on the net. I thought if we are selling children, if we're selling our children, this means we have hit the bottom, there's no further uh, b place to go. We really hit the bottom, any society. But this is happening in a technologically savvy way. Then I said, see, if this is what is happening, we must make sure that spiritual process in its simplest possible way reaches every human being on the planet. So how to do this? So we started acting from somewhere from 2007, 2008, we started getting more active online. And uh, I, I must tell you that in 2020, our reach has been 1.82 billion uh, video views. Yes. So, now this is not something to pat on my back, I see this as my 
percentage of failure reducing a little bit, because I wanted to touch the whole population in two and a half years' time. In forty years' time, I'm not even touching sixteen, seventeen percent of the world's population. I don't think it's a it, great it, success. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> like, just to put your own teaching back to you, it's okay. Right now, it's, just I, having life I'm is saying enough. it's not. It is not okay <laughs> with me. It is just that I I am made like this. Even if everything that I'm doing fails, I will still die blissfully. That much I have, so no problem with me. But the important thing is, when you're here, there are only two things to your life, profoundness of experience within yourself and impactfulness of your activity. So we are uh, a little over uh, probably 5,600 or 700 full-time volunteers and over 11 million part-time volunteers with so many people with same intention. Uh, we should not be at sixteen, seventeen percent of the world's population, we must be nearly hundred <laughs> percent. So, we are looking how to make that happen because we want to ensure at least every human being has one drop spirituality. One drop spirituality means a simple practice with which they're reminded of their nature in some way by themselves, not by teaching, not by indoctrination, but by simple process that they will do by themselves. Today, millions, millions of people are doing, but as I said, it is important because as I said earlier, much earlier, that today as a generation of people, we have things that nobody could imagine possible. I want you to look back on the great teachers and, uh, you know, many yogis, teachers, enlightened beings who've come. Let's say when uh, Krishna came, he got only one guy to speak to, and that guy is full of questions. Uh, Buddha did little better because he was better organized in his stuff and he didn't get involved in the kind of things that Krishna got involved, so he got to deliver something. Uh, Jesus came, just twelve people and one of them freaks on him. This has been the history of the world. Many great beings have come, but when they spoke, hardly ten people can hear. This is the first time you can sit here and talk to the entire world. If you don't reach out to the world now, it simply means that you don't care. When you have something valuable, if you do not reach out, it shows that you don't care. People like use me, oh, if you're a yogi, why are you marketing yourself? It's not about me marketing myself, it is about reaching the world. If you have something wa valuable and you do not reach out, in my opinion, you're just an uncaring human being. Yeah, I, I can relate to that, by the way, your last thing of why are you reaching out? Because as a writer also, somehow people expect a writer should not market himself and, and, and you know, get his name known. But I'm yes, like, they want, can make people they want oh. pornography to be marketed, they want to market their children online, this is okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, I'm like, if I can make people read books in this time, I mean, anyway, but you know, I see you as, a, you're very humble, but a couple of lessons from what you just said, I think for me and maybe for other young people there, that one, people often talk of overnight success. People always say, oh, Isha Foundation, Sadhguruji has gone, grown so big, so suddenly. It's a 40-year job, 40-year overnight. They think it happened suddenly. <laughs> 40 years, 20, 20 hours a day, seven days of the week. None of the people around me don't know what is a holiday. We don't know what's a holiday because our life is a holiday. We are doing what we care for, so it's a holiday. So yeah, so all the youngsters watching should realize that even a guru works hard. <laughs> no, there no. is hustle. Well, guru even works, there. but not hard. I work joyfully. I work lovingly. <laughs> yeah, not of course. Hard. I'm not a donkey to do hard work. <laughs> and you realize the power of the internet, which I don't think any spiritual organization, any spiritual guru realized it. And and not only you realized it, you 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 went for it, you you uh, you you adapted to it. You just see it as a way to connect to people. The thing is, when I when I started teaching in early eighties, uh, I didn't even have a microphone to teach, so I would stand up and raise my voice and speak to two hundred, three hundred people at a time. And after teaching eight to twelve hours in a day, in the night, my throat would be bleeding, actually, literally bleeding, okay? So I had to do all kinds of things to keep my throat going for the next few days to t finish the program. So from there, we got a microphone. Suddenly I realized microphone is a fantastic thing, I don't have to shout, I can talk to a few thousand people. So from there, it is natural, 
if you have something valuable and you want it to reach people, you're looking for ways, you're looking for ways how to reach them. So how is it that you did not see internet as a possibility? Because you... maybe you're uh, sitting on a little bit of success that you've achieved and you think it's fantastic. In my life, I'm not thinking of success because for me, life is not about getting somewhere. Life is just about offering what best you can because life is most beautiful when you're in a state of offering, not in a state of begging for something or acquiring something or conquering something. You never saw a joyful conqueror, did you? They're all miserable most of the time. <laughs> so, That's so it true. is... That's a good point. What was the toughest moment or two moments in your life and how did you deal with it and how, what did you learn or how did you grow from it? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question because when I look back and see, mm, many, many times I've been in situations where uh, my life was at risk was just a few seconds away from the end, but I did not experience them as very tough or anything because I don't know how to say this, this may sound kind of absurd uh, way of uh, looking at life, but I've always lived my life like this that uh, if next moment I have to die, I won't even turn back and see, I will just die. I've... I've always been like that because my experience of life within me is so complete that I never think something is easy or tough. Whatever I'm doing, the simplest things I'm doing, I'm saying, uh, if I'm cooking, I don't just cook, I make sure that I'm always trying to see how I can cook a little better than what I did Maybe three months ago I cooked once, but today I'm cooking, I want to see how I do it better, paying attention to every little thing. So, I don't know what is tough and easy because I make sure whatever I'm doing, whether I'm speaking or cooking or riding a motorcycle, I'm pushing it to its limits always, because if I'm not on the edge of life and death, uh, I've, I'll get bored of life. So, I always keep myself on the very edge. I don't think it's okay, difficult. The Punjabi, it, it, it's a bit dangerous. I'm really curious now. <laughs> not not the deepest question, but tell me some of the dishes you cook or you cook well, you think. <laughs> I'm sure people love to know what you cook. I do many things, but uh, if you eat my masala dosa, you will become my slave. You can make a full masala dosa? Like literally like a... If, uh, if, I the, make a, if you eat my masala dosa, you won't leave, you'll just hang around. See, this is... this is the <laughs> next thing happening at Isha Foundation. I am totally coming. I am t going to take you up on that offer of the masala dosa. But I told and, you, uh, you will get enslaved to me if you eat my masala dosa. I it think it's... Says this is the, my, at least my <laughs> daughter certifies that I make the best masala dosa in the world. Wow. Well, I am... Uh, I love uh, South Indian food, as many know. What is your daily routine like? When do you wake up, what happens then and, and you know, what, what is it like for you? See, as I mentioned earlier, in the last forty years, uh, it's been like this that if I happen to sleep on the same pillow for more than two to three nights, it's a big luxury for me. Only in 2020, I've slept on the same bed for two months, two and a half months at a stretch, which has never happened for me <laughs> before. So. <laughs> What is a daily schedule? I... Well, uh, Well, I wake up and always spend uh, about twenty seconds organizing my energies. What, I what time do you wake up? See, if I'm... The problem is uh, because operations are all over the world, the U.S. people think, uh, well, you know, it's time for them to say good morning to me when their morning happens. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that will be one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, they will be calling me for this and that. And if I'm here, the Indian people think I'm on a holiday during the day and they will be <laughs> calling me in the night. So there is no particular time, on an average, let me not be so this thing, on an average, if I manage to sleep by one, one thirty, I'm fine. That's my usual time. So generally, I am up by well before five o'clock or mostly by three thirty, three forty, I'm up. Uh, 
But if I have put it... You mean 1.30 a.m. You sleep at... One, let me... Cle- because a lot of youngsters here do wake up in the p.m. So 1.30 a.m. <laughs> you sleep. And say a 4.30 a.m. wake up may happen. Uh, that's, usually, that's I've always what? been for many years, always kind of come awake at 3.30, 3.40. But if I wish to rest a little more, I will rest. But I'm saying this, if I have a lot of physical activity, I don't decide what time to sleep, what time to wake up, how many hours to sleep, how much to eat, I never calculate like this. Today, let's say I'm uh, golfing eighteen holes, I walked all the way, maybe I'll eat a little more, maybe I will sleep half an hour, forty-five minutes more than usual. But that is not determined by me, I leave it to the body to decide that when... when it goes to sleep, when it wakes up. So I just go by my natural rhythm, so that's not always the same. These days I'm not doing this, otherwise for many years it's been like this. Not sleeping continuously for two to three nights was very normal for me. I will be active throughout the day and night, I will not sleep for up to three nights, I will not sleep, I'll be perfectly fine. These days I've gotten lazy, I sleep every night (laughs) Did you just say, these days I feel lazy, I sleep every night? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> that's what we, every, we all do. <laughs> no, I'm... See, this is because people are not exploring the nature of what they are made of. They are going by their own concepts. How much should I eat means so many calories. How much should I sleep means somebody says eight hours a day, you must sleep. If you're sleeping eight hours a day, you're sleeping off one third of your life, all right? I thought you came here to live, not to dodge life. You know, I... I don't know what to say. I... I'm guilty as charged. I sleep and I... <laughs> I... I where, where is this energy coming from? Like, you know, you... you think three, four hours you can function? You... you don't feel like... Today, okay, I used to be the only one, uh, for almost twenty-five years on an average, I slept about two and a half hours a day. These days, I'm sleeping three and a half to four hours on an average. Today, there are many people, hundreds of people around me who are sleeping well below five hours a day. Within the yoga center, you will see when the events come, two nights, three nights, they are not sleeping and fully active during the day and during the night. There are many, many dozens of people like that, or I can say people who are sleeping below five hours and fully active during the day, there are a few hundred people around me now. And that's why all this work happens, because uh, everybody is on all the time. And you say you don't work hard? Not hard. (laughs) See, when you're doing what you care for, see, this is the difference you have. People who are doing what they don't care for are always looking for a holiday. In America, it's called, uh, thank God it's Friday. Some studies show, some studies show that seventy percent of the Americans hate their work, not dislike, they hate their work. If you're doing what you hate for five days, Naturally, you overdose on the next two days that are available. That's what is happening. If you are doing what you genuinely care for, why would you look for a break? Why would you look for a break? Even our school is run like this. Our school is seven days of the week. We don't have a holiday. So I said, if learning is a joy, you be here. If learning is a joy, why do you want a break? If it's not a joy, don't be here because you are here because of some other reason. Don't waste my time and your time. So we have arranged days when there will be activity days. It's not announced beforehand, but maybe we'll go on a trek, maybe we'll do some other project for the children, I'm saying, so that there is a break from the academics, but there is no break per se. You are not a eighty-year-old person who needs to sleep in the afternoon or something. I'm saying, You're here to live, you're not here to dodge life. Sleep is a way of dodging life. I thought being a guru meant you could just sleep and just, you know, (laughs) bless people and and that's... that's it. I mean, mean, you know... I don't know know what kind you meant (laughs) (laughs) I I have not had much experience, but there's definitely a lot of work. Um, You know, are you ever afraid, Sadhguruji, of being over-revered? And a lot of people will treat you like you're God. I'm... uh, I'm living my life in such a way that at no point can somebody conclude I'm God or something, okay? (laughs) I keep surprising... I have seen people, how they come and how... like, you know, they're revered, it is... No, I I must tell you this, 
What is… what is unique is about people's relationship with me. If I walk into the airport or somewhere, like I'm saying young boys, girls, eighteen, twenty-year-old boys and yes. girls, they'll all shout, Hey Sadhguru, hi! I love you, da-da-da. Nobody says, Sadhguru, Sadhguru like this. Yes, there are those people also. But the relationship is a certain… Uh, at a certain level of fondness and uh, affection more than simply looking up to somebody because because it's very carefully crafted persona of ensuring that all aspects of life are there. This is very important because if you look up to somebody, you will nail them to your wall. You will never see how to emulate that. So this is a fundamental advice I'm giving to everybody. Never look up to anybody, including me. Never look down upon anybody, that's it. If you do not look up, if you look up to somebody, you will exaggerate. If you look down on somebody, you will exa exaggerate the negative. If you simply look at life the way it is, you will effortlessly navigate your life. Sometimes you don't shy away from politics. One big issue you've taken is free tea and temples, where they were literally telling the government to free temples. What's the thought process behind that? See, people must understand this. First of all, I am not a, a regular temple-going person unless I find something enormously powerfully consecrated space or architecturally it's too beautiful or engineering-wise there is something fantastic happening there. I am not a regular temple-going person. I'm saying in a whole year I may not enter a temple including the temples in the ashram, I'm saying. I may not go there at all because I'm like that. For me, if I close my eyes, everything is done for me. So having said that, in the year 2020, in the month of June or July, the Tamil Nadu government submits to the Madras High Court that 11,999 temples, not a single puja is happening because we don't have the money. And it says 37,000 temples, the income is less than 10,000 per annum. And in 34,000 temples, there is only one person who manages puja, caretaking, security, everything. Then I thought, what is this? And I asked our people to go, at least thousand people, go out and capture thousand temples. I want to see in what condition they are. My God, those videos, if you see, you will cry. I'm telling you, you cannot you cannot not have tears in your eyes because these fantastic temples, fantastic temples means work of art, architecture, engineering and phenomenal consecrations that happen in southern India. Today they're in abject state of ruin, dilapidation. I must tell you this, UNESCO says Tamil Nadu temples are being massacred. This is the word they're using. They are in a serious state of decay. These are the exact words that UNESCO is using. How do you just close your eyes to this and just go on as if nothing is happening? The fundamental culture in this country, temple is like the fulcrum. Temple is not a, pr a place of prayer. Temple is a place where you go to recharge yourself. It is a place where all the art happens, music happens. For everything, it was the hub, especially in southern India, in Tamil Nadu. First the temple, then the town. This is how they were built. First, we build a magnificent temple, around that a town arranges itself. So today, they are all in def different states of decay. So if you do not revive it now in this generation, it's finished, that entire culture will be over. So this is not just religious fervor. I have no such religious fervor. They were also places of spiritual significance. They were places of uh, energy and power. They were places of architecture, music, art. You must understand the entire southern Indian music, dance, art, everything comes from the temple. It is the devotion which made all these things happen. Devotees created music, Karnataka music. Devotees created Bharatanatyam. It is not the other way around, dancers became devotees or musicians became devotees. It's the devotees who created all this. All this is in danger if you don't revive these things which were created with enormous effort by previous generations of people. The very language, the poetry, the literature, everything is based around the temple. Now, 
government takes it over it is not the G tamil nadu government which did this it's a east india company which did that because we have this wrong perception if you leave things just as it is everything will be okay i think that american poet that amanda gorman said uh, you know just is is not justice right now what east india company did in 1817 we are doing the same thing now in 2021 and we think it's all right it is not all right it's time to revive it how can a temple be alive without an overflowing heart of a devotee how can you run subjective dimensions of life without involved people a government employee will run this i am saying that man is getting 1500 rupees per month approximately 30 rupees per day he is getting and the deities were worth crores of rupees so uh, many many of them have been sold replaced with fake deities when all this is happening if you say something you become political if you if you're concerned about this country if you say pandemic please do this you know I, yesterday i tweeted oh political nonsense why didn't you say when bengal happening okay all that happened now the surge happened now every responsible citizen has to say something to inspire people if you say everybody must vote oh he is turning political are once you live in a democratic country mm -hmm. everybody has to be political to whatever extent if you say i am not political you are just saying you are not a citizen if i go and cast my vote do i become political no that's why i told you right for a lot of people the 1.23% different dna from chimpanzees doesn't seem to be there so <laughs> that's a <laughs> what can i say that is a longer discussion okay we have to go to audience questions now uh, i'll start with the uh, Rehan Sheikh who writes from Kolkata many times our intentions are not wrong but our actions are wrong can this lead to bad karma karmic process is not by physical action it is by volition what is the volition which propels you if i have to give examples uh, just to put it into some perspective see you can take a knife and you are playing with the knife and it fell on somebody accidentally and that person died this is one karma Another karma is you were talking to your friend and he said something you got very angry in a moment of passion you threw the knife at him and he died that's another karma another ka this thing is you hate somebody you sit at home and go on planning how to kill that person but you don't do it that is another kind of karma another karma is you are let's say a surgeon you took the knife and you were trying to save somebody's life and by mistake something happened and that person died that's another karma so these are all different kinds of karmas so these karmas are not in all the karmas the same thing the act is same that somebody died because of your knife but they are not the same level of karma because the volition is different in one you are trying to save somebody's life and it went bad for some reason in another you are uh, playing and it happened by accident the karma of negligence is there with you in another the karma of uncontrollable passions are there that is there in another a uh, premeditated process of murder is there in another you kill a person not once because you don't actually perform the karma because you are calculate enough to understand if you perform this karma what will happen to you so you kill him a thousand times in your home not going there so this is the worst kind of karma you must understand it is by volition and intention not by action this doesn't mean to say you are free from action actions have their implications all right but karmic substance how it gets imprinted within you is largely by volition action can be of negligence action can be of uh, unawareness action can be of passion you know many kinds of actions but karmic imprints how strong or weak karmic imprints are within you is largely by volition how much emotionally and in thought and emotion how deeply you're involved in that that makes the imprint even today everywhere in the world even the law of the land everywhere recognizes this that a murder that happens in a you know in a moment of passion or by accident and a murder that happens in a premeditated way even the law recognizes that it's different Um Varun Reddy in Hyderabad wants to know I have heard you say that karma means action and then is non action also a type of karma 
as in an action if so then is non action a method in the madness of crafting your own destiny how would you do non action right now you think if you don't go out of your home and just sit inside non action no no you are doing more action than when you are actually going to work because preoccupation is also an action see whether you like it or you don't like it in your wakefulness and sleep you are performing action your body is doing its own activity your mind is doing its own activity your emotion is doing its activity your energies are doing activity without this you wouldn't be alive the question is only are you conscious or not varun uh, you just look at it this way from the moment you woke up today morning even it is true even in your sleep but let us look at it in your wakefulness from the moment you woke up till this time in the evening all the things that your body is doing your thought is doing your emotion is doing your energy is doing how much of it are you performing consciously how much of those actions are conscious in nature if you really look at it it is well below 1% so what i would say is try this you uh, either ride a motorcycle or please try a bicycle because otherwise you could end endanger other people's lives ride a bicycle out of 10 minutes of riding 9 minutes you close your eyes and ride you know what will be the consequence so right now it's the same thing most human beings are well over 99% unconscious karma this is why they feel that karma is hitting them from somewhere else no it is your own unconscious action because you're unconscious you think it's coming from somewhere else you're mistaking your own hand to be the hand of fate so the problem is not about karma the problem is about unawareness and unconsciousness if you just become little more conscious i would say if you if 2 to 3% of your physical mental emotional and energy karma if you become conscious if you can perform this consciously suddenly people around you think you're superhuman yes because that is how much control you will have over your life that's good uh my next question is from kalyan chakravarti who is writing from vishakhapatnam he is asking how did the first or initial species happen without any karmic substance hey, you are the expert you were saying it's not 1.23% you met people like that those species of people <laughs> 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 they are on the internet i meet them every day they are the ones trolling i i consider i i always feel like gener- like you know something like i i and every you time are, i see you are being uh, writing nasty being very derogatory to the chimpanzees this is not fair <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah i know some chimpanzee association may come after me but that's true that's true chimpanzees never trolled anybody never did anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> well about how how did the first uh, you know i think the question is about if uh, in the very beginning when there was no life if there was no karma how did the species happen is that the question do i understand it right yes 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 it's correct so we need to now you are asking a scientific question but the yogic sciences looks at it like this well you must understand what is modern science today the same things have been spoken in the yogic sciences but in a very dialectical way personifying all the different forces today in modern science they are talking about if you have a vacuum condition let's say in a flask or in a some container not inside around this f- container if you play a certain amount of energy or electrical charges within the vacuum state something called as virtual protons and virtual neutrons will happen this essentially means out of nothingness something is taking shape something is beginning to happen well it may not be able to hold itself but it happens and disappears so this is exactly what the yogic story is that all of you might have heard especially in vishakhapatnam that area there is a lot of these stories because uh, some of the saptarishis camped near vishakhapatnam if you have forgotten that you must just look around uh, there are caves uh, on the vishakhapatnam coast where saptarishis came and stayed and uh, gautama not the gautama the buddha the gautama who was one of the saptarishis comes it is believed that he comes from that andhra region anyway so we talk about nothingness nothing means that which is not 
That which is not means that which is not physical in nature. Today, modern science is clearly recognizing a dimension beyond physical does exist. They call it mm, what uh, mm, the non-existence or negative reality. There are many t ways they're trying to express it, but because it's not logical, they're struggling with these expressions. There is something called as dark energy. This means there is no any of the physical things that you recognize. Physical means there must be protons and neutrons or uh, electrons or there must be electromagnetic charges or magnetic field or something. None of these forces that you recognize as physical exists, but still there is a force beyond that. There is no name for that, they're calling it dark energy. In India, we call it Shiva, that means that which is not. Shiva does not mean a person, Shiva means that which is not. Now when somebody realized that which is not, we also ended up calling that person Shiva later on, that persona personality which came later on as a yogi is a different matter. But this non-existence or that which is not was lying inert, just empty space. Then certain Shakti or you can call it an electrical charge or some kind of energetic charge, Shakti came and jan danced upon his chest. Then little stirring happened within him because of Shakti dancing around him, he stirred up and then first form of creation came. Modern science is talking about Big Bang, I've, I've been in conversation with various physicists telling them about how yoga sees the first form of creation was Rudra, that means he roared. What is a roar? Suppose you take any automobile, whatever you have, whether it's a moped or a scooter or a car, you pull out the manifold, start the engine, it'll go bang, bang, bang. If you… if you raise the throttle, it'll roar. So what you call as a roar is a series of bangs. I've been in conversation with various physicists, they all agree it couldn't have been one bang. There must have been a series of bangs for so much to happen. So a series of bangs is a roar. So the first form of creation, first manifestation of Shiva, that which is not, became a roar. Because of the roar, a certain form arose from that form, particles, from that form, atoms, from that form, molecules, from that form, you know, cells and single cell and multiple cell and life happened. So where was the karma for all this? See, you must understand, all the karma is not yours. Right now, you are breathing. On one level, yes, it's your karma, but it's also the atmosphere which is doing the karma for you. If there was no atmosphere, you wouldn't be breathing. If there was no planet, you wouldn't be sitting here. If there was no solar system, you wouldn't exist. If there was no universe, your karma wouldn't exist. So there is a… an existential karma. In that, the greatest fortune that we human beings have is, though we are a speck of dust in this cosmos, not even a speck of dust. That's how small, infinitely, in, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, we are that little, that small. But we are given an individual experience. That is only because of karmic accumulation of individual nature. So do not misunderstand your individual karma as the birth of the universe. No. Birth of the universe is existential karma, activity happened on various levels. On inanimate levels, action happened and slowly it became animate and slowly it has become… it has become the life that we have become and many millions of forms of life behind us. Fortunately, according to Darwin's theory of evolution, you are the peak of evolution on this planet. So Chetan disagrees, he knows people who are not. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 some people. But we are, we are the I mean, peak of evolution. Internet trolls is a, is a separate session. I, I, I mean, I'll ask you someday when I come for the dosa that this is not kind. I mean, this just lack of kind. Anyway. Uh, is you can't eat my dosa that? and then troll about that. No, 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 no. I'm, okay. I'm because and becoming Because now slave. people are going to troll me. How can he claim he makes the best dosa? I did not claim a whole lot of people who ate it said that. 
So I'm just repeating their words because dosa is not an existentially perfect thing, it is only by people's taste and their opinions that it becomes the best thing. All right, anyway. You should we... don't have to clarify it, Sadhguruji. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We, we understand. You make a good dose. <laughs> we, it. we got it's placed not on top claim. of the evolutionary pile, all right? Among all these millions <laughs> of lives, we are on the very top of the evolutionary pile. But most human beings are not feeling like they're on top of the world. They're actually on top of the world, but they're not feeling it that way because they're misunderstanding their psychological realities are exist as existential realities. This is the fundamental that the spiritual process wants to change, that you become an existential creature. Once you're existential as a life, this is an exuberance of life. We are the peak of life on this planet. This is the best thing that can happen to you. But right now, you're misunderstanding your own thought and emotion as reality. The next question comes from N. Prabhu, who is in the Air Force at the Gujarat border. So, respect to you, sir. Thank you for uh, protecting us. His question is, in the light of Kung Mela that is underway, it is said that a dip in the Ganges can wash off karma. And he wants to know how does this work and what is the mechanism of this process of washing off karma by the dip in the Ganges? I think we sort of uh, touched this a little. We went over it, but yeah. Yes. But essentially, we need to understand that what we are right now, out of this body that you are, the, your physical uh, frame that is here, is a combination of five elements of earth, water, fire, air and space. Out of this, nearly seventy-two percent of your body is water. Because of that, we always created what is called as the tirth. Tirth means water which has a certain kind of memory, water which has a divine memory in it. Today, there is substantial uh, scientific data to show that water is capable of memory and is also capable of intelligent response. It is no more a belief system, it is well established in various laboratories around the world that human thought, human emotion can impress itself upon water. So, we are going to certain places which are certain vortexes of water and also at certain time in this twelve-year solar cycle, where we can make use of it, above all, it's a process of cleansing. Cleansing means all your karma will get washed away because you took a dip in the river, no. Definitely certain cleansing is happening. One day's dip is not the thing, today you are going like a tourist, you must stay there for one mandala, forty-eight days. If you are there, do the right kind of practices and use the water as a way of, uh, you know, enhancing your system, then the water within you, the water, seventy-two percent or two-thirds of body which is water, if this water behaves the way you want, suddenly you will be a fantastic human being. The entire process of yogic sciences has come from the fundamental or the foundation that we call as Bhuta Shuddhi, that means cleansing these five elements. So what you're calling as Kumbha Mela is also one expression of Bhuta Shuddhi process, which is the which is the foundation of the yogic system. Last question and last question for the evening as well. Um, Sitaram Shetty in Mumbai wants to know what is the difference between karma and dharma. My gosh, people ask you tough questions, man. <laughs> well, if your if your activity, your activity, physical, mental, emotional, and energetic activity, if you use it to entangle yourself. That's called as karma. If you use the same activity to liberate yourself, that's called as dharma. That's good. That's a nice short answer. Congratulations on yet another book, which now I realize you have a hundred and twenty. Uh, so, I don't know, but each book they say is like a kid. So, you, you love your kids, no matter even if it's the hundred twentieth one, I suppose. So, big, big congratulations. Uh, don't accuse me of I'm such things. There are 120 kids and all. Don't accuse me of such things. Just books. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just books. Just books. And I think people uh, who sometimes get daunted by very spiritual books um, uh, may find this very simple. In that way, the language is simple. It starts with an example. Well, is that deliberate? Is that your natural style to write in such a simple manner? Well, uh, generally my books are not written. It's spoken. After it's spoken and transcribed, maybe I do a little bit of fixing because from spoken language to 
written language a little bit, otherwise generally it's the tone of speaking. The idea is to get people to experience it like they're being spoken to personally rather than uh, being written in an academic language. And uh, because I don't have much education like you, <laughs> my language is of the street, whatever I picked up around, so <laughs> I don't have <laughs> that kind of thing. Sadhguruji, it has been an absolute pleasure to do this for me. I was very nervous, I must say, uh, <laughs> for this, but you made it very I'm, easy for me. I'm thousands uh, of miles away, I'm of no danger to you. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations once again on this book and Masala Dosa offer remains. Masala Dosa, but first you must read the rest of the book. I will definitely, you can quiz me because and give me chutney only if I can answer the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much.